Hi, I'm Cameron Brick. I'm Assistant Professor of Social Psychology, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you the lecture on sustainability today. Feel free to send me any questions by email. I'll include that in the slides. Okay, today's lecture is on sustainability. We're going to talk about worldviews that relate to how people think about nature and human nature interactions in the first section. Then in the next modules, we'll talk about public opinion and some of the recent research that I've been doing. And we'll talk about what it looks like to take action and who is taking action and uh, in what ways and how we can predict that as social scientists. And then we'll sort of sum up some of the evidence we've seen and look at what it would look like to provoke, promote uh, and provoke successful action through communication. So let's jump into the first part, worldviews. Psychologists measure people's worldviews by asking them um, questionnaires similar to personality style questionnaires where they can report agreement with certain items. And broadly speaking, we see that people uh, fall into three main camps of types of worldviews. Thinking prim primarily about promoting their self-interests, and that's called egoistic. Uh, promoting a lot of others' interests, an altruistic worldview, or looking at uh, other non-human species and ecosystems and Earth in general, ecological worldview, or also called biospheric. And I've drawn a line uh, underneath egoistic because there seems to be a balance such that the higher an egoistic worldview, the lower people's altruistic and ecological worldviews. You can measure these separately. Uh, but altruistic and ecological are somewhat related uh, because of this other focus. And it's not that any of these is correct. It's just that charting the difference between them helps us understand how people are thinking about their place in the world and helps model and predict how they're going to behave. So thinking a little bit more about how people conceptualize their way in the world, we can also talk about worldviews such as consumerism or materialism. And these are generally um, part of the assumed backdrop of our lives. They're part of the normal, and we don't talk about them so much. Um, but we could consider that we might agree or disagree to different extents with the idea of consumerism, an ideology that, in, that encourages the ongoing acquisition of goods and services. That is to say, the good life is made up of consuming more and more. You could agree with that to a certain extent or not. Materialism, highly related, is a value system where social status, whether people are high or low status, uh, in some sense whether they're good compared to other people, is determined by wealth, by affluence, and ownership, and consumption of goods and services. People differ in their endorsement of these items, and it, again, it's not that there's a right answer, but there are consequences that are pretty interesting, and that might suggest that uh, we could reconsider our level of uh, endorsement of those items. I'm from the U.S., so I'm most uh, familiar with the data from the United States, and one of the things that has changed a lot uh, in my lifetime, my parents' lifetime, is the size of the home per family member. So around the time that my father was born in the 40s, uh, it looked like the average house size was about half what it was even 20 years ago um, in the U.S. per person. And that's interesting because if you back up and you ask a, a bit of an unusual question, that is, why are people living in bigger homes? You can see that some of the answers rely on those consumerism, materialism ideas, that it is better to live in a big home. It, it is higher status. It uh, might lead to higher quality of life and those kinds of questions. And what's good about formalizing those questions is you can test them. Does living in a big house lead to happier life? And Broadly speaking, psychologists think of happiness in terms of two main components. The first um, positive affect or emotion would be the frequency of experiencing positive feelings, moods, and emotions. And I've separated feelings, moods, and emotions because these are a bit difficult um, to think about as separate categories in the way we use them normally. 
But it, psychologists think of emotions as brief, uh, brief states that are sort of activated. Like you wouldn't be fearful for 40 hours straight. If so, we, we generally wouldn't refer to that as an emotion like fear. You might think of it as a, uh, a temperament or a mood or anxiety or something that has a bit uh, more permanent feeling to it. The second main component for happiness is subjective well-being, which would be how happy are you with your life? Please rate from 1 to 10, where 1 is the worst life possible and 10 is the best life possible. And it turns out that you know the frequency of people experiencing positive emotions and their subjective well-being aren't the same, uh, but they are related. And we generally think of these as two main components of whether people are happy. Now that we've defined a way to think about and measure happiness, and we've seen that people dramatically increase their home size in order to be happy, does it work? And broadly speaking, the evidence suggests that the higher people are on materialism, the more they endorse materialist values, the lower their well-being and the lower amount of helping they do for others. I'm not going to play this video here, but um, feel free to look that up later. It's a very interesting six minutes to give you a little bit more detail about what materialism might mean in our daily lives. This isn't a core part of what you need to study. I'm just throwing this in here because I thought it would be useful for you. Uh, the evidence-based work uh, on what makes people happy, and this is uh, some this list compiled by Dr. Sonia Lyubomirsky, who's a social psychologist in the U.S. And so, again, not part of the test, uh, but highly recommend these, and they're possible whether you're working from home or not. Okay, so back to the core lecture content here. There's an economist I really like named Robert Frank, and he can start to explain why bigger homes aren't leading us to happiness. There are some things where when everyone pitches in, everyone improves. And actually, the economy can be this way. That is, if I devise a new product and then people buy that product, everyone gets richer, everyone has a better experience, perhaps, um, you know, the economy expands. That's better for everyone. But status games in particular are always zero sum. That is, if I'm in the 70th percentile for social status in my neighborhood, and then everyone doubles their home size, I'm still in the 70th percentile. What has changed is now my home is more expensive, it's harder to clean, I have more possessions. Uh, you know, it's actually almost worse in every way to play these status games. And he uses the example of deer on the cover here because uh, antlers are basically bad for the individual animal. Uh, they get caught in trees, they cost calories, they, they make it harder for that animal to survive, but they need them in order to show off and acquire mates and fight with others. So this status game is sort of leading everyone to suffer in a, in a way, and that is true of some games for us. So the key here is to identify is this thing that I want or this thing that I consider good, is it a status game? And if so, not playing might uh, be better for everyone if you can organize your society that way. One example, since the Netherlands loves speed skating, is helmets. Helmets slow you down a bit uh, in a high-speed sport like cycling or speed skating. And so if you ask the individual speed skater, would you like to take the helmet off? They would say yes, they'd win more races. But they all know they want to avoid brain damage. And so all the competitors would get together and say, please make us wear helmets. As long as everyone wears them, then there's no competitive advantage for taking them off. We're all safer. That's better for the sport. It's better for them as well. So now that we've thought a little bit about consumerism, I want to talk about human nature relationships. When I say nature, you might picture a scene like this, something without any humans in it, hardly. But I think, that, I think we should be careful with this vision of what nature is, because all these other scenes that look more like cities, um, these are all scenes that include nature as well. And wherever you're sitting right now, probably in a building, look around and, and you think, this isn't nature, and yet, you're breathing air in and out. You're going to have water at some point. There's a constant interaction with natural resources in any setting. I mean, I can't imagine what a setting would be that had no nature in it. 
So that is to say there's always a relationship between our built spaces and natural spaces. They can't be separable in the way that we can sometimes think about them. I think that's just true. But let's go now to talk about something more subjective, which is how, uh, how we think about our relationship with nature. One of the backgrounds that people might endorse is the master narrative, which is that nature exists for human use. So economic, prob economic growth and technology can solve any environmental problems, and the existence of a forest is only worthwhile to the extent that it is worth something to humans, whether to enjoy or um, uh, cut down for wood or anything else. Another potential perspective is called steward, uh, with it, we have a responsibility to care for nature on behalf of God and or future generations. So that would be like, it's not just there for our use, uh, we can use it, but we also have to take care of it, kind of like as if nature were our garden. A third view might be that we're participants, so that humans are interrelated part of nature and share in its health or illness. What's interesting about the contrast between one and three here is that the master narrative sort of has folded within it the idea that if nature is sick, we can solve it let's say, through human organization and technology. And number three suggests that we're more vulnerable. And that, that concept of vulnerability is interesting. And so when you talk to people about environmental problems and whether technology will fix them, let's say global, global warming or anything else, listen for that component of uh, humans can fix everything or not. I think it's true for some environmental problems like the ozone layer, we solved that one pretty quickly. Uh, and not as true for others. If you're watching at home, pause here and consider what groups or ideologies represent each of these views. Can you think of a social group uh, that, um, that is a champion of one of these types of perspectives? Continuing on. Now that we've blurred a bit the line between nature and the built environment, we can consider what is an environmental problem. Often when people are asked, you know, how would you rank environmental issues in your country relative to other issues such as terrorism or immigration or the economy or health, people rank environment fairly low. And that makes sense when you're doing it with this strange ranking exercise because Independent of all those other human-focused outcomes, people don't so much care what goes on in the environment. But the key is that they're not independent. Our economies depend on the environment in the same way that our economies depend on public health. They're not separate issues. So any environmental problem, whether it's the ozone layer, or climate change, pollution of the waters, the nitrogen crisis in the Netherlands, has an overlap with our economic system, with our values about what constitutes our traditional and appropriate lives, with public health, and sometimes uh, also with national security concerns. So it's not trivial to carve up an environmental problem and say that it's separate from the rest of our lives. So this takes us to the title of the lecture today, Sustainability. And I'll suggest to you that we should define this in a fairly technical way that doesn't have a lot of values in it about Mother Earth or any of the rest of that. Sustainability would be a balanced system where what you're extracting uh, and using from the existing natural systems, whether it's in wood or, or uh, in building cities or, or wherever, is stable. That is, what you're taking out is similar to what you're putting in, or if you're building a bunch of cities below sea level, that the sea isn't going to rise and overwhelm the cities. The idea is that the system is stable, the community of interactions between li living organisms and other materials for an ecosystem, and in broader physical sense, the community of interactions between natural forces and uh, human endeavors, cities, and civilization. So this is, a, this is obviously a very complex problem, and you have to spend a certain amount of money and attention as a society trying to encourage sustainable systems if you want to have sustainable economy, health, etc. It's not a surprise to you that we are wildly unsustainable at the moment, and that is largely the result of rich 
uh, Western individuals and companies consuming vastly more resources than the Earth can replenish. One of my big research interests is climate change. So we might want to know what year did science explain global warming due to humans releasing carbon dioxide? So pause for a moment and just write down in your notes, what do you think? What year was it where it became abundantly clear and scientists were now conf communicating with the public that uh, this is for sure going to happen? It's a little bit earlier than most people realize. It was proposed publicly in the early 19th century, then it was modeled in a chemistry laboratory also in the 19th century, and then more recently we've been actually measuring CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, especially from one key observatory in, in Hawaii on a mountain. Okay, so there's, there's a, a government public service announcement from the U.S. that I really like, and it's from 1958. I'll play it for you now. Extremely dangerous questions, because with our present knowledge we have no idea what would happen. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottomed boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. Foreign weather were not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, but with life itself. Okay. So the Keelan curve, what I just mentioned about carbon dioxide being measured in Hawaii at the Mauna Loa Observatory, is this line you see uh, in black, which is just steadily sloping upwards, which is not supposed to do that. So the atmospheric CO2, carbon dioxide, is going up quickly. The variation in red is because there are seasonal differences in, in how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. And the reason that this is really important is because we know that increased CO2 causes increased temperatures, and that's been known a long time as we just went through. This graph, definitely the longest timescale graph I ever present, uh, is that we can see the historic temperature of global average temperature on Earth. And, uh, and we see that there is, you know, there's been warming and cooling periods. But up until about, uh, you know, recorded history, sort of the last 10,000 years has been extraordinarily stable in terms of temperature. And then in the last 100 years, we're starting to see a spike in temperature based on our uh, based on our industrial revolution. So we're at a real turning point here. Either we're going to turn that around or we're going to have a much warmer Earth with all of its consequences. The consequences look like this. Doing nothing would be one of the top two lines, depending on what happens with the economy and our, our choices of extraction and fossil fuel use, etc. Or we could do something like uh, follow the Paris Agreement, the international agreement, uh, on climate change or even something more uh, more aggressive on climate change looking like one of those lower lines we're still even in the best case scenario looking at a sustained period of increased temperature which will cause various problems okay so that was the first section which is worldviews and a bit about uh, climate science and now we're going to talk about if that's the science that's the physical fact of the matter what is what are people thinking about it how would you study such a thing? And what can social psychologists contribute? One of the most impactful pieces of research in this area is about how people think about what scientists 
are saying and thinking about climate change. So on this graph, we show US responses to the question, what proportion of climate scientists think that global warming is caused mostly by human activities? So if you had most Americans answering, let's say, I don't know, zero to 20%, they're saying that they think most scientists disagree that global warming is caused by human activities. Well, if they're saying 81 to 100%, then they're saying, yeah, most scientists agree. This is what the actual data looked like about 10 years ago. It hasn't changed as much as you might hope since then. A lot of people don't know, and then there's a pretty broad range. And I've highlighted in green, this is the correct answer. And there's overwhelming agreement among scientists about uh, the consensus that global warming is caused mostly by human activities. This is interesting because uh, it, the existence of a fact isn't sufficient to communicate it to the public. For a long time, for example, it was known that cigarettes caused cancer. Cigarette smoking causes cancer. But, um, but it took a while to get the public on board with that message. And we're in this transition period with the fact of climate change. One of the most influential works about this consensus estimated that 97% of peer-reviewed research papers that stated a position on climate change said that it was human caused and happening. Later estimates revise that upward, actually. So it, it is an overwhelming consensus compared to other areas uh, of scientific inquiry where there's active debate. Just to broaden out for a moment from psychology and consider economics, markets are incredibly efficient at managing the accurate pricing of goods. Let's say a good like taking a flight from here to Australia. The flight is appropriately priced to the extent that governments uh, don't intervene with subsidies uh, or special taxes or tariffs, and that the price includes all of the relative cost of the voyage. And it turns out that's not a trivial assumption. And so externalities are what ec economists call factors that are not included in the price. And right now, the carbon emission from the flight is not included in the price because no one is paying it. The company isn't paying it, the governments aren't paying it, and then the consumer doesn't pay it in the price. So in order to have a market solution to climate change, you need regulation and enforcement of making those externalities part of the price. And so consider two things. Atlantic cod fishing, which um, totally collapsed the economies of uh, you know, coastal Canada and also uh, several countries in Europe that were very dependent on fishing this uh, fish called cod. I put the Dutch word there in parentheses. And it's the problem was that it was overfished because it wasn't properly regulated or priced. The price of cod didn't account for the fact that they were destroying the fisheries. So that's a, um, a common use problem. CO2 emissions from land use currently aren't counted at all either. So... Uh, I'm all for markets helping us solve climate change. I think they would be one of the most powerful tools, but you have to get the price to be accurate for that to work. Let's consider some about psychological interventions, like the sort of thing that uh, social psychologists might design. A while ago, some social psychologists came up with an idea around norms, and it turned into a giant company that, that they didn't start it. Some other uh, business-minded individuals noted the science and started it. That's So maybe you can do that as well. And what they found was, okay, at the end of the month, when you're sending consumers information about how much energy they used in their home, whether it was energy or water, different things, they send lots of these messages. Can you phrase that uh, update in a way that helps them reduce their energy use or water use? And the answer is yes. So here on the upper left, we see a descriptive norm. That's a key word which is that you use 602 kilowatt hours this period, your most efficient neighbors use less than that, and your average neighbors used more. There's no value judgment in there, that's just the information of what was used. And on the right here with the smiley face, we have an injunctive norm, that's another keyword, which is whether that's good or bad. And you can see it goes from great to good, to using more than average, just as a flat line face. And they use flat there um, because they originally used frowny face and people complained. Even sort of a frowny face in people's messages, they were like, who are you to give me a frowny face? So that just tells you how seriously people view this shape of a couple pixels on the screen. 
What's amazing about these kinds of messages is that they have a persistent effect of about 2%, reducing household energy use 2%. And so if you scale that across all of the households that have uh, been getting these messages just from the O-Power company since 2007, 20 terawatt hours have been saved, which is enough to power all of Spain for a month. Just from changing the slight wording on these, uh, on these messages. That's a very powerful world change from a relatively subtle intervention. Much easier, for example, than changing the externalities of what's included in the price of an airline ticket. So we're looking for these kinds of gains um, and different circumstances in which we can spur people to appropriate behavior. I've been also giving a lot of talks recently about tipping points. So that could be about social norms or, or perception of what's going on in society that suddenly take a shift. The Me Too movement was a shift in terms of uh, appropriate workplace protections and uh, appropriate behavior, um, especially from men towards women. Brexit seemed like it came out of nowhere for a lot of people. Um, of course, there had been strong nationalism in the UK and elsewhere, but leaving the European Union was a shock. People are having a sort of a change about how they're thinking about immigration, particularly in countries that have welcomed a lot of immigrants in the last decades, etc. We can think about environmental tipping points uh, in a similar way. It used to be acceptable to throw rubbish on the ground long before most of you were alive in the mid 20th century. And then it developed a bit of a moral message. There was uh, public campaigning around it, community involvement, and now littering is unacceptable. I think recycling also went through a similar thing, you know, during my childhood where we were getting lots of messages about it in elementary school, and now it's just a normal part of life. And if you took someone, uh, you know, with a big seat, you saw someone with a big bag of rubbish that was recyclable and you saw them putting it in the landfill, it, when they could easily recycle it, it would seem like a strange action in a way that it didn't used to. So there's tipping points going on in the Netherlands around farmers and nitrogen. Uh, and there's tipping points globally going on about rainforests and CO2 and climate change. And I've added question marks because these, it's not clear how much of a change there is, but I think there is a change happening and I'll, I'll make that argument in, in public opinion, in public actions. Another example of a potential tipping point or is currently around air quality. There's more and better science suggesting that air quality is affecting children's health and community health in ways that are both unfair, unnecessary, and unequal in that they affect different populations to different extents. Uh, like in poor neighborhoods, the air quality is worse. So when we think about uh, air quality, it might have helped us slightly predict a dramatic tipping point in petrol versus diesel cars being registered in the UK. If you look at this graph, you can see that new petrol cars from 2007 were more common than diesel, and then as time went on, diesel became more and more common. And if you were to predict what would happen in the, uh, you know, in the next few years, you might think, well, diesel will stay the same as petrol or maybe even overtake it. And that would make sense. It's very hard to predict these things. But what actually happened was a giant scandal with uh, Volkswagen and, and uh, air quality around diesel that had been hidden and diesel plummeted. Another tipping point I think is going on is around climate change in general. The Extinction Rebellion is a activist group across many countries, but especially active in the UK. And they have protests and uh, they stage marches and they only have a couple actually very focused demands. I think one of the reasons they've been successful is because instead of trying to include all different kinds of subgroups or related ideologies in their mission, they've stayed quite focused on uh, a, a set of very climate related things. The government needs to tell the truth on climate change. There needs to be uh, a declaration of emergency um, that sort of, you need to have a citizen's assembly to help make better governance, that sort of thing. What's interesting about Extinction Rebellion in 2019 is that they had protests that had thousands of arrests. And, and that's really saying a lot, because if you had a protest and five people got arrested or 25, you know it's the hardcore, the deeply committed, 
When a thousand people sit down and agree to get arrested, it's grandmas and it's cousins and it's people that are not hardcore activists. So some something is being reached. A public note here is being reached. I think there's something changing. We've been studying the Extinction Rebellion, me and uh, some colleagues, and I want to show you a couple studies. Okay. So one study we ran was an online experiment where we showed people different messages. And this was the first day of a major uh, um, protest in London in 2019. What we did is we knew the protest was happening, so we set up the study in advance. And then the morning of, right when the news was being released about the protest, we took those news broadcasts and we compared uh, how people felt about the protest from which piece of news they got. So one, stimuli, one stimulus in the upper left here was the BBC had a three-minute video talking about the protests, fairly even-handed. Uh, in the lower left here is a Extinction Rebellion spokesperson who is recording a video from the front lines talking about his experience and what the purpose of the protests are. Presumably, you'd think that would be more Extinction Rebellion supportive. And on the right here, uh, is from a more right-leaning daily uh, newspaper in the UK. And you can see it starts with commuters face chaos, which is their choice of the most important frame of what's going on in, with the news. And what we see here are the results of how people reacted to a question. So just think about the question first, then I'll walk you through the graph. It's whether they think that disruptive civil disobedience, like blocking streets, is necessary to force government action on climate change. And do they support or oppose disruptive civil disobedience? We collapse those two to give a better measure of their support for these actions. Now, if you look at the graph on the left, support is at zero here uh, if there was no change. And then as, as numbers go up, that means more support for the actions and numbers down less. And we can see that uh, the BBC message and the Extinction Rebellion message led to relatively more support for this disruptive civil disobedience than did the Daily Mail article. And that's as expected. Now, in the lower right here, looking at a regression, which is predicting people's support for the disruptive civil disobedience, we can see that political orientation, as indexed by conservatism, does predict some of the variance. So the more conservative, the less support for disruptive civil disobedience. And that makes sense because conservatives in general are committed to public order and um, supporting the government and those sorts of things. But you might be surprised that environmentalism, which is how much people thought of themselves and wanted to be seen as environmentalists, is a really massive predictor here. So the strongest that was measured in the study. And we'd call that variable identity one kind of social identity. Okay, walking on to another study here, we also did a study where we measured support uh, for the disobedience before, during, and after a major uh, event. And in this case, we didn't show them any messages. We didn't even tell them anything about the protest, actually. We just asked whether they support it. And so they would have needed to find out about the protests through their own methods. So here on the very left in the before column, you can see that at the top is the bright line green saying strongly support, and at the bottom is the red saying strongly oppose. And before, during, and after this major um, protest, you can see whether there are any changes. And we actually collected this data in the UK with a nationally representative sample, so we can extrapolate with more confidence to the whole population of the UK. And there was an increase from before and after of 4%. That is, 4% more of the population strongly supported the actions after the uh, protest in London was shut down many streets and caused chaos for commuters. Uh, and that's 2.2 million more people supporting, strongly supporting the action following the protest. That's actually quite a large amount and a big success story for Extinction Rebellion's purposes. I'm, I was surprised by this. I thought that uh, the public might uh, might oppose the actions more. Or if they didn't, if there was a, a, an increase in support, I expected that there might be a commensurate increase in strongly opposed. You can see that the percentage which strongly opposed also went down. It could have been otherwise, that strongly support would go up and strongly opposed would go up, a polarization. But that is not what we saw. This is 
further support for my argument that I gave you earlier that maybe we're seeing a tipping point. Concern for the environment in general is also going up. We didn't collect this data, so this is, uh, this is collected by another survey firm. You can see that uh, in the last 10 years or so, concern about the environment is around the highest levels on record, suggesting that something is shifting. <clears throat> in the Netherlands specifically, Milieu Defensi, you might have heard of, they are an uh, environmentalist-related non-governmental organization. And they're doing a big organizing style grassroots campaign right now where their purpose is to investigate concern and preferred solutions around climate change. This is a very effortful project by them. They have uh, are hundreds of volunteers doing in-person interviews, and then they also are collecting data online. And they're asking people, you know, who should be responsible and do you want to get involved and those sorts of questions. And we're analyzing that data now, so we're looking forward to sharing some more with you there about the current state of climate change concern and engagement among the Dutch public. Okay, when you think about a tipping point, when you think about maybe, you know, let's say that a lot of people say they're concerned even when 10 years ago they didn't. Is it possible that their private beliefs change so dramatically over a fairly short period of time? I'll suggest to you the psychologist uh, perspective is here that may, is that maybe private beliefs don't shift as much as they seem to. When there's a new public poll and some support for a gay marriage or uh, concern about climate change or something takes a dramatic turn, part of what's driving the effect is that private beliefs can become public. And so people always were concerned about climate change, and presumably you are somewhat concerned, your friends are somewhat concerned, but it just doesn't feel like a part of daily life. Uh, whereas if you get the sense that everyone around you is suddenly caring about it and expressing that, when the perception of what's normal changes, then you can express your private beliefs publicly, and that leads to a visible shift and a, and a potential cultural shift in, in uh, policy and individual behavior, etc. So if I'm suggesting the tipping points are predictable, and we can explain what's causing them. Why are they so hard to predict? How, how come we don't know what's happening next year? I certainly don't. And part of the problem is that individuals don't always know what their relevant thoughts are that influence their endorsement of certain beliefs. They have a lack of insight about the key psychological processes uh, that are leading to their policy opinions. So that's a lack of insight. Another problem is that people sometimes use social signaling, which is to say they have a private belief, but they won't tell it to you honestly because they need to, they feel that they need to say something in order to be a good group member or to maintain their social reputation. We broadly call that social signaling. And this can lead to uh, dramatic patterns of incoherence and inconsistency. It's actually kind of strange to imagine, but if you measure a lot of policy beliefs, people often hold beliefs that are very contradictory to each other. They don't make logical sense. And if you study the same person over time, they endorse things that aren't consistent with their previous beliefs either. And so it's kind of a mess. And I wouldn't think about policy uh, preferences or people's beliefs as being well justified or consistent or rational most of the time. Okay, so that was the section on public opinion. Let's talk now about taking action. Question, is it our goal to increase concern? If only we increase people's climate change concern, then surely uh, better behaviors, individual behaviors, and public policy will result, right? I, it may be that environmental concern is important, but not as important as we might intuitively feel when we're crafting interventions. I want to share with you one of my favorite papers from a colleague whose name is Kim and Eum. He's in Singapore, a faculty member there. This paper is about culture, but that's not the reason I'm going to show it to you. I want to look at it because he graphs the link between concern and support for environmental action across many different countries. Let's take a look. Here are a bunch of different countries. Okay, and they differ in some cultural variable on the x-axis. That's not the point. 
On the y-axis here, we see the relationship between environmental concern and support for environmental action. And so the higher you are on this, on the y-axis, the closer the relationship between concern and support for action. And you can see in the upper right here, the United States is a dramatic outlier. They have the highest relationship between uh, concern and action, and they're looking not very much like these other countries. Most countries are a bit uh, in the middle and not that strong a relationship, to be honest. Germany, for example, has a correlation of 0.2 between environmental concern and support for environmental action. You might ask yourself, how strong is a correlation of 0.2? This is what a graph of 0.2 might look like. This is simulated data. And I've added the trend line, but if you didn't have that bold line, it's hard to even see that the dots slope up to the right. It's a fairly weak relationship. So that is to say, environmental concern is maybe not capturing as much variance as you might expect in whether people want to take action on the environment or do individual behaviors. That takes us back to trying to identify other things that predict behavior. And so one of the ones I showed you earlier was the consensus, the scientific consensus that human-caused climate change is happening. Maybe that's leading to changes in beliefs that, you know, that climate change is real, that's human caused, etc. And maybe that is uh, in turn leading to changes in policy beliefs and personal action. And so this is, a, this is a reasonable model and we could think of environmental concern as being an additional predictor, but maybe weaker than we originally expected. One of my favorite theories in this area is the theory of emergency response. Now it wasn't um, developed in reaction to anything about environmental problems, but it applies actually quite well. And so it, it's saying, when will people respond during an emergency? And you can consider uh, as, uh, as we go, how people would have reacted to coronavirus versus something like climate change in terms of these stages. Okay, so the first stage is to notice the problem if you don't even know there's a problem happening, it's unlikely you're going to do anything in reaction to it. Okay. Stage number two is interpreting the problem as an emergency, something that would need immediate action or else there's going to be bad consequences. And here, my favorite video to play uh, is by psychologist Dan Gilbert. So let's pause and watch that video. It's about 10 minutes long. It's said that Dostoevsky used to deal with annoying children with a very simple trick. He would tell them to go stand in a corner and try not to think about a white bear and come back when they'd been successful. In the 1800s, this was a very difficult thing for annoying children to do, and it occupied a lot of their time, which was the intention. You'll be happy to know the task is going to soon get much easier, because even under moderate projections, the shrinking summer ice is going to wipe out two-thirds of all the world's polar bears in the next 40 years. William James said, a new idea is first condemned as ridiculous and then dismissed as trivial until finally it becomes what everybody knows. This is exactly the trajectory that our national conversation on global warming has taken. First, the critics said there's no evidence for warming. Then they said there is evidence, but the warming isn't human-made. Then they said the warming is human-made, but the consequences will be trivial. And now the person whom President Bush derided as ozone man has a Nobel Prize, and pretty much anyone who can read knows we're in trouble. The question is why. Not why is our planet getting warmer, but why when we know it's getting warmer are we twiddling our collective thumbs? Well, when the nice folks at Starbucks gave me the opportunity to say exactly 50 words to millions of pre-caffeinated and therefore highly suggestible Americans, <laughs> I decided to write these. The human brain is the only object in the known universe that can predict its own future and tell its own fortune. The fact that we can make disastrous decisions, even as we foresee their consequences, is the great unsolved mystery of human behavior. When you hold your fate in your hands, why would you ever make a fist? The question is, why indeed?
Why? After all, our brains evolve to respond to threats. We do it all the time and we do it very well. A predator or a gunshot would instantly empty this theater. We're a very small, slow, fragile species, but we dominate our planet because we have a brain that's very good at detecting and deflecting threats. So why not global warming? It's because our brain is not evolved to treat all threats the same way. We respond to threats that are, have four properties that are intentional, immoral, imminent, and instantaneous. Threats that have these four features trigger our brain's ancient alarm system and they spur us on to action and threats that don't have them don't. Global warming has none of these properties. Consider, for example, the first one, intentionality. Our brain, you know, devotes specific chunks of its precious real estate only to things that are wildly important for our survival. So vision has an area, language has an area, shopping has no area. <laughs> it turns out that our brain devotes specific real estate to thinking about the minds of other people. We have special networks devoted entirely to processing information about what human agents think and feel and want and intend. Indeed, some scientists believe that our need to understand the minds of other people is actually what drove the remarkable, unprecedented growth uh, of the human brain in the last two million years. Now, Understanding others is so crucial to our survival that we have all become fetishists. We've developed an obsession with anything human, which leaves us hypervigilant for any signs of human agency. That's why we see faces in clouds and we never see clouds in faces, right? Nobody's ever mistaken the Virgin Mary for a tortilla, but the other way around <laughs> all the time. Now, our obsession with things intentional explains why we worry more about an underwear bomber, annual death toll zero, than about influenza. Annual death toll in America, 40,000 people. Why? Influenza is a, influenza's a natural accident. Underwear bombing is an intentional action. And the smallest intentional action captures our attention in a way that the largest natural accident just doesn't. You know, if this airplane had been hit by lightning and then crashed into the World Trade Center, none of you could tell me the date on which it happened. The fact is, global warming isn't trying to kill us, and that's a damn shame. Because if climate change were some kind of nefarious plot visited upon us by bad, bad men with worse mustaches, right now we would be fighting a war on warming uh, with or without congressional approval. Now, the second thing about global warming, the second reason that it doesn't put our brains on orange alert, is that it doesn't violate our moral sensibilities. It doesn't cause our blood to boil, at least not figuratively, because it doesn't, it doesn't confront us with anything that feels repulsive or indecent or impious or disgusting. Your moral emotions are aroused by the kinds of things that the brain has been concerned with for millions of years, food and sex not atmospheric chemistry. And that's why every society has elaborate moral rules about who you can kiss and what you can eat and none whatsoever about when you can run your air conditioner. Our brains respond to violations of these moral rules with feelings of alarm and disgust and those feelings compel us to action. If global warming were caused by gay sex or caused by the practice of eating puppies, Americans would right now be massing in the street, calling for its end. The second, the third reason that global warming doesn't ring our ancient alarm is that it's a threat to our tomorrow, but it's not a threat to our evening. Like every other animal on this planet, we respond very well to clear and present danger. Our brain is essentially a get out of the way machine that is constantly surveilling the environment, trying to find things out of whose way it should right now get. And that's why we can duck a baseball in milliseconds. Now brains did this for hundreds of millions of years after they appeared on this planet. That was their primary job and then very recently they learned a new trick. They learned to make predictions about the future. In other words, they learned how to get out of the way of things that are not yet coming. 
This new talent is wonderful, but from nature's point of view, it's still in beta testing. It's still in the early stages of R&D. A very small part of our brain is responsible for thinking about the future, and a very large part is responsible for getting the hell out of the way of a baseball. This much, this much for, this much for now, this much for eternity. That's why we care less about the future than any rational analysis suggests we should. You know, if you give people a choice between getting $100 now and another amount in one year, they basically demand about $200 in order to wait. That is an interest rate that would make the loan sharks at MasterCard roll their eyes. It takes a huge amount of cajoling and nagging and pleading and training to get people to do anything on behalf of their future selves, from saving for retirement to flossing. And it turns out only 28% of Americans even say they floss, and you know some of them are lying. <laughs> the fact is, if the polar bears were going to be extinct Friday, you would be hanging out with them instead of me. The fourth feature that global warming lacks is this. Our brains are extremely sensitive to changes, changes in temperature, weight, uh, pressure, sound, light, all physical dimensions, but the rate at which things change makes a big difference. If the rate of change is slow enough, changes go undetected. Beware, young men, beware. Changes like this happen one hair at a time, okay? There is no day in which you wake up and say, I'm a bald man. In fact, if you don't have a spouse to inspect you, you might never actually realize it happened. Now, we accept these gradual changes, changes we would never accept if they happened abruptly. If I'd woken up one day without that and suddenly looked that way, I would have gone running to the nearest hair club for men begging for plugs. Okay? The fact is that we accept changes that happen slowly Changes that we would never accept if they, uh, changes that happen slowly that we would never accept if they happen quickly. Many environmentalists say global warming is happening too fast. No, it's happening too slowly. It's not happening nearly quickly enough to get our attention. The impurity of our air and our water has increased dramatically in my lifetime, but we all tolerate it because it's happening one day at a time. You know, there are warnings today, don't eat fish, don't swim in this river, don't go out on a particular day because of the air quality. You're all used to that. When I was in high school, which was not in the 1800s, that was science fiction. If our rivers had become oozing cesspools overnight rather than over decades, we would have thrown all the polluters into them. Environmentalists worry that it's not happening fast, worry it's happening too fast. As I said, it's not happening fast enough. The bottom line is we are the progeny of creatures for whom the greatest threat was a man with a stick. Okay, we're beautifully engineered to respond to threats that have the four eyes, to evil people who suddenly appear on the horizon and threaten our immediate well-being. When we're confronted with threats like this, we respond exactly as our ancestors would have, with firm resolve and crushing force. Terrorism is the kind of threat that pushes every one of those buttons, and that's why we gladly relinquish our civil liberties to keep terrorists at bay, but we won't relinquish our hummers to do anything about global warming. Global warming is a deadly threat precisely because it sneaks in under the radar that we've evolved. It evades, if you will, the brain's ancient alarm system and it leaves us asleep in a burning house. The only question is whether we can find a way to rouse ourselves to fight an enemy that is silent, amoral, and slow, but much more dangerous than any that our ancestors ever imagined. Thank you. Okay, so threats that get our attention, the four eyes from the lecture, are these four. And I normally like to pause and do a class exercise here, and you can do it as home, at home as well. So just pause, pause the lecture for a second after, the, after this instruction. What kinds of messages could change the perceived risk from coronavirus? Consider concrete messages uh, just for one or two minutes and then come back to the lecture.
Just to give you a broader view about how people are thinking about climate change, it's interesting to compare how people's perception of its exaggeration changes over time. And we can see the sort of teal color uh, that has the highest peak here uh, is saying it's exaggerated. And 2010 was around the time, um, if, I, if I'm not recalling incorrectly, that um, it was a 10 year anniversary of an inconvenient truth and so there was a lot of public discussion around climate change. But uh, you can see that actually a fairly large proportion in the US continue to think that climate change is exaggerated. And this is a bit of a surprise given the surety of the science. I'm not gonna include these uh, on the test, but just in case you wanted a little bit more depth on psychological theories that have been used to explain this discrepancy, I would consider these three. So very briefly, confirmation bias is about how we interpret information based on what we already know, and that isn't necessarily a bias. I mean, it makes sense that we'd wanna interpret new information skeptically if we already had information about that topic and the new information surprised us. Elaboration likelihood is about how we think about new information based on its source and uh, our mood and motivation and such. And cognitive dissonance is about how we understand what's happening and, uh, and why things happen. So for example, if I'm confronted with a piece of evidence that suggests that I've been behaving badly for a long time, I might be less likely to accept that that evidence is true independent of its factual truth, just because it's inconvenient for the rest of the cluster of thoughts and attachments I have. So if you go back to the theory of emergency response and you consider the first stage, notice the problem. Psychological barriers that might exist at this stage include things like not knowing about uh, global warming or not understanding how the relationship between fossil fuel burning and uh, and increase CO2 and increase temperature. It could be low perception of threat from the four eyes we saw a minute ago, or it could be rejection of conflicting information using that cognitive dissonance kind of framework, which has also been written up by others uh, in terms of cultural cognition. You can Google that for more information if you want from a law professor named Dan Cahan, who does some very interesting research. Now, stage two is interpret the problem as an emergency. Many of the same barriers for stage one also apply to stage two. But another thing is that as questions like, is climate change humans caused? As questions become more verbal and elaborate, then it, it provides more opportunity for us to insert our previous knowledge and commitments. So a question like, uh, is the earth warming? is kind of harder to fight than should we do anything about climate change? You know, the more wiggly and verbal and elaborate the question, the more opportunity for motivated reasoning. Okay, so stage three, which we haven't seen yet, is that in order to respond to an emergency, you need stages one and two, but you also need to feel personally responsible to act. So there's many barriers at these stages. This might be the most interesting from a social psychology perspective. And three such uh, things that I'll mention are self-interest, free riding, and belief in a just world. Okay, so let's talk about the tragedy of the commons, which was pioneered by Hardin, but later uh, challenged by um, uh, science, uh, economist Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who showed that this isn't always true, and she did some amazing work that was celebrated with the Nobel Prize. Uh, but the very idea here at the, at the core is that there's a challenging tension between self-interest and collective interest with any common resource. And in this case, in this diagram, the common resource is the field. Every individual shepherd can have sheep grazing on the shared grass. And in fact, it's sort of, there's an incentive to get more and more sheep because the grass is free and the bigger your herd, the more wealth you have. And then every shepherd might develop more and more sheep. But then if there's so much sheep, they eat all the grass, they trample it down, it can't regrow. Basically, you have an unsustainable system. And then everyone suffers. That is, they would have been better off just with smaller herds. So that is the tragedy of the commons. It can occur. It occurred for the Atlantic cod. Uh, but some smaller communities can solve this problem. 
uh, in creative, um, self-governing ways. That was some of Alstrom's work. The second uh, barrier I mentioned is free riding, which is that if you have many people working together on a task, then there's an incentive for the individual not to work hard because others are carrying the shared load. And I mean, you want to consider this in terms of, let's say you share where you live with other people, who's cleaning, are there dishes in the sink, or who's going out and buying the household staples, those sorts of things. We all have this uh, problem at some point in life where we're trying to get people to other, other people to participate more. And we think about ways to get them to do it, like guilt tripping them or asking them or talking to them or whatever. I can share with you, there are some tried and true psychological techniques to help reduce free riding. So we don't need to walk through them here, but to the extent that you can boost these characteristics in a social interaction, people will free ride less. And so that uh, that can be an evidence-driven way to get the dishes done at your house. For another um, example of how this might work, consider that everyone in this class would get the same grade, the class average on the exam. Okay, go study for the exam. Would you think you would study more or less if, if you were to receive the class average grade on the exam? If you're like most people, you would study less, and that is because it violates several... Um, of these characteristics to reduce free writing. The last barrier here is um, for stage three is belief in a just world. This is an interesting one. Research shows that people have a strong need to believe that the world is an orderly, predictable, and just place where people get what they deserve. And this belief plays an important function in our lives because to plan our lives or achieve our goals, it kind of follows that we need to assume that our actions will have predictable consequences. And so we, when we encounter evidence suggesting that the world is unjust, we quickly act to restore justice by helping the victim. Or, and here's the tricky bit, we could persuade ourselves that no injustice has occurred. Maybe the victim deserved the crime. Have you ever thought that it was strange to hear that a woman deserved assault based on how she was dressed? That attitude makes sense when you see it as a coping response to avoid having to do anything if you believe that the world is generally a fair place where people get what they deserve. So this is kind of like cognitive dissonance. Instead of believing ourselves personally responsible to act, we might believe that there's a problem, but that things are just the way they're supposed to be. This is also called the naturalistic fallacy, and it leads towards inaction. So... Consider one related to the coronavirus. Let's say that it disproportionately affects the elderly and that the youth just generally aren't very impacted. That, combined with a belief in a just world, which people vary in, you know, some people believe more highly or less highly in a just world. But if they believed highly in a just world and they were young, you can imagine them more often responding to the news of coronavirus with something like, well, yeah, it kills lots of old people, but it's okay. I mean, they were old anyway, or they were already sick, or don't you know that there's environmental problems all over the world? Why don't, why don't, is better for overpopulation or something? And those kinds of statements, which are uh, not very compassionate to the elderly, are manifestations potentially of a belief in a just world. So these, I've just shown a few barriers to feeling personally responsible to act, which was stage three. Stage four of our, not of the theory, but of today's um, modules on, uh, on environmental issues and on climate change is effective communication. But before we get there, let's just think about what we've learned so far. So the theory uh, of emergency response has these five stages. Notice the problem. Is it an emergency? I should be personally responsible to act. Uh, and number four, which we'll talk about in just a second, is, is knowing what to do. What concretely should we do about it? And number five is doing it. And we'll, we'll uh, blow by those in just a minute here. But in order to know what to do, uh, people need communication. They need to understand what, um, you know, what is it that they're supposed to do. And so experts and governments can communicate with them about what is the most important problem and what should we do about it. And I think the opportunity here is for uh, social sciences to 
reframe how conservation, sustainability, and an environment are talked about in the public in a way that makes them easier to solve along with managing our other shared um, outcomes that we care about, such as public health and the economy. Yes, we can reframe the discussion. It has been done in the past to make uh, to reduce harmful actions, improve helpful ones while preserving those other things. And uh, milieu defensi was part of that, uh, importantly, in the Netherlands. Some successful campaigns in the upper left here is around a, a river that was actually repeatedly being lit on fire. It sounds ridiculous, but it's because companies were dumping um, flammable liquids into the river and, the, and that was sometimes catching on fire. And now they're not allowed to do that anymore, which, uh, which leads to some improvements in us having our rivers on fire. Okay, that sounds decent. In the lower left here, a picture from Santa Barbara where I uh, did my PhD actually, and this is of a surfer who's covered in oil because of a uh, oil spill that led to the formation of Earth Day, which is now a global phenomenon. And uh, I would consider here that this isn't just about environmental campaigns. We can think about which campaigns were most successful in the Netherlands too, like around traffic safety and uh, Stop to Kindermort, which was a, um, a really fractious uh, and controversial battle between car owners and streets that are designed primarily for cars to, to lead to where we are today, where a lot of street space is devoted to walking and cycling and relatively little is devoted to cars compared to how it used to be. Still a lot of total space. So if you look at those campaigns above and you look at the kinds of graphs that people generally show, images that generally show about climate change below, pause for a moment and consider, is there anything odd about these messages or is there something missing in the uh, typical climate change messages we see below? Take a moment to consider what that might be. What I'm seeing in particular is that there's no people in these. There's not much relevance to people's daily lives. One of the interesting pieces of research to come out of this is the identification that maybe instead of environmental concern, you know, what we need to do is identify what people already care about and then connect that to climate change so that people can help care about climate change more and, and action related to it. And I want to highlight Linda Steg, who's Steg, I guess, who is one of the um, most important figures in, in, uh, in this field and is a professor at, um, at Groningen. Okay. So the idea of this study was that, um, let me back up for just a second. Before I tell you about the study, we're trying to motivate individuals towards taking individual actions that can improve uh, global climate change. And one of the ways that we can do that is by taking individual actions that uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions through reductions in energy use, for example. We can right now reduce United States emissions uh, a large proportion just by upgrading households with current technology. And I say current technology because we don't need to invent better furnaces or develop uh, special smart meters or it's not like that. And this was actually before smart meters were quite common. We can do it now with basic stuff that's available. So why aren't we doing it? Well, that's why to do studies like the, the one by Bain, which I'm walking you through as, uh, shortly. So these are individual actions like uh, alternative transportation, diet, uh, uh, reusable bags, uh, types of, of uh, lighting and heating, and of course, voting as well. And these, these behaviors, as I've shown here, go beyond the household. The idea is to transcend this thing, this classic model of climate change mitigation, where if we just tell people what they need to know, they're gonna care about it more and then they're gonna act. And unfortunately, this just isn't sufficient. We've been doing that for a long time and people aren't changing their behavior fast enough to create a sustainable system. So we need to improve on this. And one of the ways, uh, you know, that has been classically used to try and communicate the importance of uh, of taking action is a message like this. 
here's global temperature graphed around each year, you know, uh, since 1900. And we're just seeing that as time goes on, the temperatures are getting farther and farther away from the middle. That is, things are getting warmer and warmer and they're accelerating. They're not just getting hotter more recently, they're getting hotter faster. And we're getting dangerously close to these red circles, which we know are problems. But it can be hard to think about that when we have scenes of local weather that don't look like that at all. For example, here's a picture of where I taught last in New York. I mean, the most incredible snowstorms I'd ever seen. It doesn't feel like the earth is warming. So maybe it's not enough to know that it is. Maybe we need other things. And Bain's idea was, well, what if we could emphasize the co-benefits of mitigation? Mitigation meaning taking action to reduce greenhouse gases. And one of the powerful things about this study was that it involved samples from 24 countries. Okay, so, including the Netherlands, by the way. Okay, so here's the, here's the idea. How will your country be in 2050 after action that prevented significant climate change? Now, you could ask them about... Uh, how it will be on climate, but he asked them on other things like what's going to be going on with economy, education, etc., dysfunction, crime, and how will people treat each other? Will they be more or less caring, warm, etc., if we take action? So that's the basic idea is thinking about how do people think about action on climate change, not for environmental outcomes, but for other outcomes. And so what we're going to see here is the strength of the correlation between how they're thinking about these changes <clears throat> in comparison to how important they think climate change is. Because the classic model would just be, okay, climate change is going to be the thing that is most important. These other things aren't going to matter that much. Matter that much uh, for the public and political behavior intentions, which is their likelihood, their you know prediction of how involved they'll be in these public and political behaviors to mitigate climate change. What we see is that climate change importance has a modest uh, positive correlation, as we saw with the other um, study by Eum, but these development and benevolence and to some extent competence things are, have moderate and similar sized correlations as well. Now, what about if we look at domestic household behaviors like we were just considering? Well we have the same picture again. Development and benevolence seem important. And if you look at, <clears throat> you know, what, well, actually, let's skip that. So this overall is the meta-analysis showing the average correlation between climate change importance, co-benefits, and motivation and behavior, um, you know, across 24 countries. And what we're seeing as a main summary is that development and benevolence, which are just non-environment co-benefits have comparable effect sizes on intentions as climate change importance. So maybe we should be communicating those rather than polar bears or in addition to. To sum up the communication, the best advice right now is to have the three R's, reality, risk, and response. And um, some of the best advice about how to communicate this is to repeat, repeat simple messages from a variety of trusted sources. So just having a president say it, maybe not enough, president and scientists and healthcare professionals and weather people on TV, then people will really start to get it. Uh, and so that's the best advice there. In this last section, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my own research program about what makes people do pro-environmental behaviors. And in particular, let's say this person is considering throwing the plastic bottle in the rubbish or in uh, the recycling. Maybe the recycling is farther away than it's pictured here. In particular, I've been working on whether uh, the presence of other people matters. Think broadly about why people do things. We are motivated, all of us, to feel good about ourselves and our groups. And the behaviors that we show other people signal our, our identity and our reputation, our worth, our status to other people, which is why we try and dress nice and say smart things and uh, do the right thing or be, you know, optimally different from other people, but not too different. Or, you know, this is the social status identity signaling thing 
covers a wide range of what we like, what we prefer to do. But the insight here is that pro-environmental behaviors also have social meanings. But it might matter how visible they are. Like in the upper right here, a reusable grocery bag is highly visible. But on the lower right, water, uh, water use is not as visible. So we might know which of you know, our close friends shop with reusable grocery bags, but we might not know which of them take ridiculously long showers. The other insight in this line of work is suggesting that how people think about themselves matter. If you remember back to one of those early studies on Extinction Rebellion, we saw that one of the strongest predictors was environmentalist identity. I'm going to suggest that that's important again here. So we go from non-environmentalists who might be anti or just not engaged to environmentalists who might be protesting or have strong beliefs about uh, uh, what we should be doing regarding nature. So there is a set of cool studies already suggesting that environmental behavior is uh, involved in identity signaling. First study here called Green to be Seen, which was the first evidence that people sometimes choose green uh, or eco-friendly goods for social status reasons. And I highlight Josh Tiber here because he's at the, um, at the VU. Okay, so that was the Green to be Seen effect. Then there was a really cool piece of work a few years after that suggesting that political conservatives in the U.S. buy an energy-efficient light bulb less when it comes with a sticker that says protect the environment. When it didn't have the sticker, they bought it more. And that suggests that there's something about this sticker that, because it only happened to conservatives, that you know has some social group importance to them. And so it's affecting how they might think that they might be seen by others or it's affecting how they see themselves. And we called this sort of gray to keep away, like a non-environmentalist not wanting to be seen doing a pro-environmental action. And the key here is to recognize that this is the same effect. It's all identity signaling. It just depends on uh, where you are on the spectrum. So I want to show you a wonky table from my dissertation. And this is, this is showing what is predicting people's pro-environmental behaviors across uh, 21 different behaviors, diet, transportation, exercise, uh, no, diet, transportation, uh, uh, energy use, uh, etc. And we were trying to predict that their average frequency of engaging in those pro-environmental behaviors from lots of other items here. And you can see that environmentalist identity is again a strong, unique predictor. Surprisingly, political orientation, shown here as liberalism, had no effect when it was included with these other predictors. It's, it's likely uh, had some of, you know, maybe it had a relationship until it was included in this overall regression, but here it's showing it has no unique variance to contribute. So if you knew anything about them and all you knew, you know, was their political orientation, you might not know very well whether they're doing these pro-environmental behaviors. And we don't have to go into it in great uh, detail here, but visibility and the relation and the uh, interaction here between identity and visibility, which was what I was suggesting to you on the last slide, were also both significant predictors. The most massive predictor here was difficulty. That is to say, when people reported that they were doing behaviors less, they also reported that those behaviors are relatively more difficult. A good real-world example of this can be seen in, uh, in a recent campaign by the World Wildlife Fund, I think, which is uh, they were trying to reduce rhino horn purchase in Vietnam, which was associated with social status, uh, to protect existing rhinos. And they knew that they had to communicate this message to wealthy urban men, uh, middle-aged. And so... The advice from the consultants was, don't include your logo on this. Don't say it comes from environmentalists because these people don't want to see themselves in that group. And that's hard for an organization to accept, that they should fund you know, a million dollar campaign, or I don't know how expensive it was, um, but not brand it with their own uh, organization. What, what they eventually went with was this Qi-branded uh, set of marketing messages. For example, success and good fortune come from within, and that you don't need to have rhino horn uh, to be successful. And it seemed to lead to a reduction. Uh, so this was apparently successful, and I think maybe one of the components of why it was successful was because they didn't 
bind up rhino horn avoidance with environmentalism, which those participants might not have wanted to be connected with. That was a terrible sentence, but you get the idea. All right, so to sum up this section, Individuals signal social identities with pro-environmental behaviors, and so current campaigns, to the extent that they signal social groups, like a green leaf or a Mother Earth or eco-friendly, if you're trying to get a broad range of people to do that behavior and you include you know, indications of social group, it might make it more difficult. Okay, so zooming back out. Knowing what to do is step four in the theory of emergency response. I'll show you some behaviors uh, highlighted by Dietz et al., and then we'll talk about what we can do at the societal level. Here is a list of a bunch of behaviors, and I want to draw your attention especially to weatherization. So we see weatherization as the top behavior change item in this list, achievable carbon emissions from household actions. And it's, in, it's the top item in the list because you can combine two factors to consider, well, what should we target? And the two factors are, what's the impact? That's potential emissions reduction. And how changeable is this? What is the behavioral plasticity? We know the plasticity uh, because of previous efforts to change it through regulation or through messaging, any of those things. And so weatherization is both impactful and highly changeable, meaning it should be a number one target. Weatherization, by the way, is improving the energy efficiency of the home, for example, sealing off drafts or um, uh, making it so that you don't need as much energy to heat the home. Overall, broadly, looking at society, there's two main things that we're doing with regard to climate change that can help. One is mitigation. We've been talking about that, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But a second one is adaptation, which is even in the best case scenario, we are going to have rising seas and uh, rising acidity in the seas, and we're going to have rising temperatures, and that's going to cause increased flooding and a series of problems. And so we have to adapt our civilization to manage those problems, even if we stopped emitting uh, any carbon tomorrow, which we won't do anyway. So those are the big two, adaptation and mitigation. We need to do both of them. The good news is we have solved large-scale collective action problems. Um, we showed incredible public response to coronavirus, immediately changing a lot of how things are done around society. And so it is possible. Um, we we had big public responses with a lot of individual um, a lot of individual sacrifice for several multi-country projects in the past. I think it is plausible for climate change as well. This is a review slide, which I hope will help you study for this particular lecture. These were the main um, components seen this day. And if, um, and if you saw the modules across two different lectures, then this is from both of them. Uh, feel free to direct questions to me uh, in the upper right there. That's my email, and I'm happy to hear from any students. Thanks very much.